Hi, my name is Justin Laborde. I'm a firefighter with South Metro. Welcome to Station 12, home of the Black Pearl, for Fleet Friday. Aerial medic response. Ah! All right, so here we have the uh, seat of the engineer. This is obviously the driver of the rig. Uh, he's going to be the operator, so he, he's going to run all the tools. He's going to make sure that the ladder is operating correctly, uh, make sure that the crew's getting what they need inside and outside the fire. Uh, you can see up here, we've got all the controls, uh, basically the brains of the truck. Um, so we can run the generator, we can run the aerial master. Um, we also have our pump PTO here as well. And then a bunch of information on how the rig is doing, how it's performing, um, if there's any issues with it, stuff like that. Um, so he's gonna be basically the caretaker of the rig, uh, making sure that everything's operating right and get us to where we need to be. So here's what we call a shoreline. We have a lot of batteries and different things such as the MDT, um, different stuff like suction for uh, cardiac arrest that need to be charged on a regular basis. So we plug our rigs in to keep the batteries charged up and the rig ready to go so we don't kill the batteries. Um, further back here, this is where the firefighters are gonna sit. Um, so here on the truck company, we designate this seat as the Delta seat. Um, the other seat's gonna be the Charlie seat. We do it a little bit different in the fact, uh, other different than engines in the fact that we have two separate teams on this rig, uh, or we can. So the uh, Charlie seat and the Alpha seat, that would be the firefighter, uh, probably the junior firefighter, and then the officer. They're gonna be the Alpha team Typically, they would be designated for search inside, um, interior overhaul, or helping the engine crew move that hose in interior. The Bravo team is going to be the Delta Seat firefighter, typically the senior firefighter, and then the engineer. Um, they're going to be uh, responsible for outside duties, such as throwing ladders for egress, not only for victims, but for uh, firefighters in, the, in, uh, in case there's an emergency. Um, they're going to be softening the building, such as forcing doors, making sure there's no window grates, um, just making sure that the structure is going to be safe for the firefighters operating inside and that they have a way to get out. Um, so back here we have our pump panel. Um, this rig is going to be a little bit different in the way of the amount of water that we carry. So this rig carries 500 gallons of water versus the other trucks in South Metro's district that only carry 300 gallons. Um, so we have the ability to pull hose off our rig. Um, we can pump whatever we need. We can pump our aerial master stream. Um, we don't necessarily need an engine to do that work for us. Um, and that helps with our response in our district. So if we have a car fire, a trash fire, something else, we're not pulling an engine from way outside of our district. Uh, we can handle it within our first two. We also have different tools. Um, so this is gonna be the uh, hook and a halligan here. Um, it's mounted on the outside of our rig just so it's easy for me to grab. So I can come out uh, with all my bunker gear, my SCBA. I can grab my tools here, take them off, go to the back of the rig. I can get my ladders and work my way uh, most likely to the Charlie side to get a 360 of the building and, and check to see if there's any issues, where the ladders need to go and um, stuff like that. Uh, we have our water rescue rope. So anytime that the lakes freeze, uh, ponds freeze, in Colorado um, and there's a dog or a person that's felt falling through the ice uh, we use this rope and our Mustang suit which you guys have probably seen in prior videos if not we've got lots of them um, we put that on we end up going into the water and we use this rope to pull the victim and our firefighter that's rescuing the victim back to the shore back here this is going to be our engineers compartment um, so he's got lots of different tools in here So we have our Halligan, we have a pig, uh, bolt cutter, sledgehammer, elevator keys, um, different stuff for working on couplings, um, getting them apart, putting them together. Up in here we've got lots of different nozzles, um, adapters, just different things that we may need to change how we're pumping and what we're doing um, or create something uh, creative in order to fix a problem. So we can do different sorts adapters, 
um, anything that we need, you name it, it's in this compartment here as far as pumping goes. So these up here, these are going to be our cones. Um, cool with these cones, they pop up and then we can place them uh, on the road or wherever we need to cut down access so that we don't have unwanted vehicles or pedestrians in our area. Um, so we just use collapsible cones just to put them in there a little bit easier for storage. Um, the coffee can that we have up here that you see is labeled sand there. Uh, that's going to be for slick roads. Um, so that way we can create traction or when we set our outriggers out, if there's ice on the ground, uh, we're going to try to melt that ice first and then we'll put that sand down underneath our pad so that we can keep our truck as stable as possible and not slide back and forth. On this side of the slide, uh, we have our fireman's axe and then we also have a piercing nozzle. This is a cool tool that we use to get um, fires that are in confined spaces that we don't have access to. So if there was a fire that was behind a wall, um, we could stick the end of the nozzle here into the wall and then we can drive it in. Um, and you can see these little holes that we have at the end of the piercing nozzle. The water is going to flow through, it's going to break up, and that's going to um, cause our steam conversion and put our fire out within that confined space. So we can use this for attic fires, we can use it for basement fires, uh, car fires. Um, some of the more prevalent spaces that you'll see these on uh, would be for aircraft firefighting rescue. Um, they have these on those rigs as well in order to pierce the fuselage and put fire out. Our compartment for stabilization and our airbags for lifting. On the top shelf here, got a lot of bags that carry a lot of equipment so on this top shelf we've got our rescue 42 jacks um, I'll show you the jacks in just a few minutes on the bottom side here but basically we can take these jacks after we've stabilized a vehicle creating a tripod uh, we can set these jacks on them and we can lift our vehicle so if we have a patient that's underneath the vehicle if we have another vehicle um, or we just need to lift it up for whatever reason um, we can use these jacks which make it really stable and easy for us to lift we also run a fair amount of lockouts. So we have our lockout kit here for vehicles. We also do them for houses as well, um, but those will be some different tools that I'll show you on the other side. So we have a uh, uh, air jack here, and then we have a couple different wedges. Um, and so we can stick those wedges in the door. Typically, uh, for me personally, I like to use the blue wire here so that I can mold it, it's uh, bendable. I'll stick it into the door of the vehicle and then either operate the lock, operate the latch, or operate the button in order to open up the car. This is where we're gonna have our Rescue 42s. As we talked about earlier on the top shelf there, we have our jacks. Um, for the Rescue 42s, grab a long one here. This is what we would use to stabilize our vehicle. So let's say a vehicle is upside down. Um, I would stick this in a good portion of the vehicle, um, just someplace where it's really stable. Um, I can extend it, I can pull my pins out here, and I can extend to get to my vehicle. Um, once I'm at my vehicle and I have contact, uh, we can either use those Rescue 42 jacks or we can use ratchet straps that we have here. In these handy bags. So we've got a bunch of these ratchet straps I would hook my ratchet strap to the base and then I would have another one on the opposite side of the car. And um, I would tension those, that ratchet strap together, creating a, what we call a tension buttress. And that's gonna stabilize the vehicle from side to side and hopefully a little bit front to back. So stabilization is important because uh, we're gonna send somebody in the vehicle, especially if we're extricating somebody. So if there's a patient in the vehicle, I want a medic or somebody that can render care to that patient right away. Um, and I don't want that vehicle shifting, moving around. Um, if somebody's arm is hanging out of the vehicle or a leg or there's a chance that it'll fall on a firefighter, I wanna make sure that it's as stable as possible. In our compartment, we have our airbags, which are also gonna be for lifting. So my bag here has all my airbag controllers in it and hoses, we'll go over that in just a second. This here, this is gonna be my airbag. Um, we have different sizes to accommodate um, different amounts of lift. Um, as far as like weight and tonnage, we have um, different sizes just depending on how our object um, kind of forms to our pads when we put them down there. Um, and we're going to lift off this X here. So they're all just different in size and uh, help us decide which one we're going to need in order to get the lift that we want. 
The cool thing with our airbags is that they run off the same bottles as our SCBAs, so the 5500 um, Scott bottles. So in this bag here, we have our controllers. So this portion here, this also has the same quick connect that I would use for uh, my SCBA bottle. So I'm gonna take my bottle, the neck of it, and I would stick it in to the uh, pressure reducer here. So I could stick it in just like that. Now it's connected, I can turn my bottle on. The pressure regulator is gonna be this portion of it. Uh, right now you can see it's in the off position. The bottle is obviously not on, but if I rotate it over, um, it would be in the on position. And then I can adjust the pressure that I want coming out of my bottle. Uh, we like to operate here at South Metro at 118 PSI, um, and I can adjust that with this knob here. Our hoses, so this would be the hose that we use to connect um, to our dead man switch, and this is gonna be the dead man switch here. Uh, kind of a weird name, but we call it the dead man switch because if there's something that happened to me as we were lifting an object, if I'm not pushing the buttons or operating it, um, it just, it doesn't work. So it would be a dead switch. So this hose would connect to my regulator and then that uh, one side and then the other side would connect to my dead man switch. And then I have my separate hoses here, which would go to my airbags. Um, so typically we like to lift with two airbags. Um, so I'd take my airbags out, I would stack them on top of each other, put them underneath the object that I'm wanting to lift, and then I can control each side independently. So we would lift the bottom until we make contact with our object, and then we'd lift the top and that would create our lift um, for however much space we need to get, either for a victim or whatever we need to do to lift uh, for the object to, to complete our task. Call a torpedo tube. This is gonna have our uh, extra SEBA bottles. So typically on a fire, if I were to run out of air in my first bottle and I needed to, what we call recycle, I could come back to my rig and get another bottle and our whole crew has the ability to swap out bottles. That way we can go back to work. This here, this is gonna be our water can. Um, we carry one on this side, one on the other side. So if we were to go in and we're just searching uh, unknown fire location or it's a small fire that we know we can handle, this has two and a half gallons of water in it that's pressurized. Um, I'd be able to put my fire out with this. In this compartment, we have our cribbing. Um, so as we talked about in the last compartment there, anytime we're lifting, we're cribbing. So the saying that we have here at South Metro is lift an inch, crib an inch. So we have different size cribbing. Um, we've got four by four cribbing. We've got our four by four cribbing here. And then we've also got two by four cribbing. So if I don't need the space of a four by four, I can use a two by, uh, two by four. We also have our step chocks. So that way I can stick it underneath the vehicle, typically upside down like this. And when it sits in at that angle there, it's kind of like a triangle. And I have a lot of range in order to create my uh, progress capture. And then we also have different things like wedges. Um, same concept as a step chop. This one here, this is also gonna be a torpedo tube. Same thing, we just have spare bottles. You'll see a couple more on the other side. They're gonna be set up the same way. This compartment, this is gonna be um, our extrication compartment. Um, so we have a sawzall at the top here. This is gonna be our cordless sawzall. We also have a corded sawzall in the compartment here so we can run it off the, the power of the rig. Um, the sawzall is great for extrication just because it's really mobile. Um, it's actually really quick and we can cut a lot of stuff um, without having to carry a big tool. Um, down here, this is gonna be our generator um, for our hydraulic tools. So it's got hydraulic fluid in it. We've got our hoses here. Um, we can hook our hoses up to our hydraulic unit um, and pressurize our tools. Uh, these tools will basically cut anything that you and I drive on a regular basis um, with relative ease. Um, so here we have a cutter. This is what we call a straight cutter, just because the blades are straight, um, straight on. And then we also have a ram. This is our ram so that we can um, extend. It's a telescoping ram um, and we can create lift with this as well. So if we needed to move a dash or we needed to push a vehicle, um, we have a lot of range with our ram that we can use. 
Down below here, this is going to be our battery operated tools. Um, they're the same concept, they're still hydraulic um, and they have a power unit, but the power unit is going to be with, contained within the tool. Um, so I have my battery here, um, I can check what my battery level is at, and it's as easy as turning on the power button and operating the tool. So we can pull this off and we can start going to work right away. And all you got to do is twist the handle. And that's how these battery operated tools work. This tool is going to be the same concept as the cutter that I talked to you about earlier. However, this is going to be angled, so the cutter is at a slight angle. Um, that helps us when we're cutting um, different posts, such as the B post or the C post, keeping this tool outside of the com uh, patient compartment. Um, that way we can operate more freely and we're not impinging on our patient. So Ladder 12, has, Ladder 12 has these tools because uh, when there's an extrication within our district, our battalion, um, even sometimes outside of our battalion, and there's an extrication, uh, we would go to it. So uh, we're not necessarily extrication specialists, but we have more training on these extrication tools um, in order to get patients out. So typically you'll see an engine, they would pull a line on scene just in case there's any risk of fire, um, and they would start to stabilize the vehicle and render patient care. The truck would be called typically at the same time if it's uh, designated as an extrication, uh, we would bring the tools and we would start going to work cutting the car open and getting our, our patients out. If the extrication becomes more uh, than what we can handle with our tools that we have or it's very extended, larger vehicles, multiple patients, uh, our rescue company would come and they have uh, just bigger versions of the tools that we have but also more specialized training um, to back up what we do and augment getting the patient out. So this is our small ladder that we use. Um, to climb up to the pedestal where the engineer is going to fly the aerial or fly the stick. So when we climb up here, we have our uh, safety bars. Um, that way nobody can fall out of the rig. Um, this is going to be the actual pedestal. Um, so the engineer has all his controls in order to control, move, um, extend, retract the ladder. Uh, on this rig here, we have what we call another dead man switch. Um, so you have to have your foot depressed in the box here in order for the aerial to be operated. Um, even if I'm on the tip, um, I have controls on the tip as well in order to move the ladder to where I need it um, in case the engineer couldn't see where it was or I just need to get a little bit closer. He still has to be down here um, on the dead man switch in order for me to operate it. So we have oil dry. So if somebody has an oil leak, uh, fuel leak, some sort of hazardous liquid on the ground um, in small amounts, we can use our oil dry in order to suck it up um, and that way we're not letting it go into the drain system. Uh, we have water keys, so if we have a water leak, we can shut water off um, out in the street um, if we need to. Then we also have our blue, or, sorry, our uh, orange bags there. That's gonna be our ropes. So, um, this is what we can use to attach our patient to. Um, and because we have an aerial, we can create basically an elevated mechanical advantage. Um, so if we have a patient that's on a roof, if we have a patient that's down in a foundation and they need, like they, maybe they broke a leg or something, they need to get out, um, we have a rope system that we can use on the end of our aerial and create an elevated mechanical advantage or a change of direction. We've got different uh, pulleys, so we've got lots of stuff in order to create mechanical advantage. Um, the engines will carry these bags as well, but they carry less equipment and only one rope. Um, so the aerial is trained to do more mechanical advantage, such as a five to one, um, high point change of direction, um, just more advanced skills um, that the engine companies may not have time to, to train on. Um, so we have the ability to just create more rope systems and safely get patients out of precarious positions. Uh, we have other tools such as a scoop shovel, um, different kinds of shovels, like if we needed dirt to dam and dike something um, to keep hazardous material out of the water system, uh, we've got squeegees, we've got brooms, um, anything that we need to kind of like clean up a mess or help with um, mitigation of water, um, any issue that a home owner may be having. We also have wildland gear in here. Um, typically here at South Metro, the truck companies don't run uh, wildland related calls just because it's a big truck. It's more of a, a pavement type truck, um, not a brush engine. Uh, but we do have the ability to respond to those wildland calls um, in the event that it's a much larger call, uh, we need more personnel, um, you just never know. So we have it, 
um, just in case. Uh, we also have wildland hose up there. Um, and then we have a big cellar nozzle, uh, which is unique to this truck here. So if we have a attic fire that we're having trouble, uh, access trouble uh, with, or a basement fire where we can't send crews above the floor or we just need water into a confined space, kind of the same concept as a piercing nozzle, but much bigger, uh, we can use that as well. On our ladder, um, you can see here we have this orange bag. Um, that's gonna be what we call a Stokes basket. Um, so again, if we have a patient that's in an elevated position um, or they're down in a ditch or uh, just in a uh, uh, basement, some place where we don't have access to, we can't just walk them up or carry them up, uh, we can use a Stokes So basket. basically the Stokes basket is gonna be a big backboard that has sides on it. So if a patient had a broken leg and they couldn't move, we could load them into our Stokes basket. Um, we can strap them in or lash them in. Um, and then we can create our rope system with our elevated change of direction and then we can pull our patient or victim out of uh, whatever position they're in that they need help with or being rescued out of. On the ladder, we also have another ladder. Um, so we call this our parapet ladder, it's 12 foot. Um, so it's just a really short ladder. But if we go to a roof um, and there's what we call a parapet, so the, the roof line extends above where the actual roof is. Um, and it's a drop down on the other side, mainly for looks or just to make the building look good, different um, facades, that sort of stuff. Um, we can use this ladder to get down and create access. That way we're not jumping down uh, basically into a hole. Um, so this would end up going to the tip of the ladder and then we would put the hooks in and then that way we can climb down and be safely on the roof um, and not get hurt. We also have a hook up here, so if we forgot a hook down there or we just need an extra hook, we have the ability to grab this one um, and do work on the, on the uh, roof as well. So down here on the tip of the ladder, um, this is, these are gonna be my controls to control my master stream. Um, so you can see I have the ability to go from straight to fog. Um, currently we just have uh, smooth bore tips on here, but we also have a adapter that we can put on there that's a fog nozzle. Um, I can go left or right and I can go up and down. Um, so that way I can get my water positioned to where I need it. Uh, we also have a speaker up here. This speaker uh, talks to the pedestal down there for the engineer. Um, so if I need to communicate to him at any point in time, um, he can hear me down there. Uh, this speaker is always going to be on so he can hear anything that I'm saying or what I'm doing um, versus that speaker down there. He actually has to push a button to talk. Um, on the other side here, these are going to be my controls for the aerial. Um, so this will operate only at a quarter of the speed that the aerial can actually run at. So when I'm operating this, it's very, very slow, um, but they need to be precise movements. So the aerial operator, my engineer, he's going to get me as close to my objective as he can. Um, and then I can finish getting the objective the rest of the way by myself um, using these controls up here. Um, this is going to be my pin for my waterway. So you can see it's currently pinned in that rescue uh, position there meaning that it's gonna be on the second fly of the ladder, the second portion from the top. Um, if, I have, if I take my lever and I rotate, I can bring my pin out. Um, this one, we have to move our waterway up just a little bit. I can put my pin in, and now my aerial is in the defensive position, meaning that the end of the waterway or the tip of the waterway will actually move out to 105 feet. Um, and we can get a really elevated master stream to put water on the top of the structure. And then to put it back, it's just gonna be the opposite. Put my pin in there and lock it into place. Now it's back in the rescue position. These are gonna be the controls that the engineer is gonna to use to put our outriggers out. So in the event that we need to fly our aerial, uh, whether it's gonna be for an access issue and we're gonna use ropes or we just need to get to a higher spot on a building uh, or we're gonna have a defensive fire where we're using our aerial master stream, uh, these are the controls that he's gonna to use to put our outriggers out. These controls here, they only get activated um, in the engineer seat. So I showed you that panel that was up there earlier. Um, he pushes some magic buttons and gets the uh, power back here and then uh, we can set the rig up for our aerial 
Um, this rig will fly, has a stick that's 105 feet, and we can fly it straight out to the side. So we have to have outriggers in order to keep our rig stable and not flip over. This compartment is gonna contain all of our ladders. Um, so you can see we have an assortment of ladders here. Um, we have a 35 foot, 14, 28, 16, and a straight 20. Um, so these ladders are what we call ground ladders. Um, so I would take these ladders out and then I can get access to uh, patients, whether they're on a second floor or third floor, um, sometimes even in a basement, you name it. These uh, ladders we use for patient access or elevated access into a structure. Also back here, we have some other specialized tools. Um, so this is gonna be our dog snare. Um, so if we have a dog that's in the water that we're trying to rescue, um, or they're just in the, in the structure, we have a patient, uh, maybe it's just an EMS call, uh, we can use our dog snare in order to um, contain the dog and make sure that he doesn't harm us and we don't harm it. We also have lots of hooks back here. Um, so we use these for overhaul, um, maybe even leverage, um, just a tool that we use on a daily basis um, in order to complete tasks and objectives that we get. In this compartment here, this is gonna be our five inch. So as I said earlier, uh, this rig has the ability to pump, meaning it also needs the ability uh, to utilize a hydrant. So we can connect to our own hydrant just like any engine can uh, with all our adapters and fittings here. Um, and then we have our five inch in this compartment. So this rope here, I would use this rope to pull my five inch out, loop it around my hydrant. I would turn my hydrant on. As soon as I see water and I know that the hydrant is good, I'm gonna send the truck uh, to wherever the fire scene is and I'm gonna continue dressing the hydrant. Uh, this, this loop just helps me so that I don't have to hold it or step on it. It just stays contained to the hydrant and they can drive away. So lower down here, we have an intake. This intake is a straight pipe to the aerial master stream, meaning that it bypasses the pump. Um, and I'll show you on the other side, we have some more intakes um, and discharges that we utilize. This here, this is gonna be our aerial drain. So anytime that we charge the aerial, there needs to be, the water is gonna sit in the pipe. So we need to be able to drain that water out so that we can bring our ladder back and, and stow it. In this compartment, this is gonna be uh, for emergency operations. So if there was an issue with the rig, like an electrical issue or hydraulic issue, um, this would be where all the, this is where all the overrides are um, that the engineer is trained on in order to um, correct that issue or bypass whatever issue in order for us to keep operating. So in this compartment here, this is gonna be the same um, operations as the last compartment on the other side for the outriggers on the right side of the truck as we're looking at it. In this roll up, this is gonna be um, our tool bag, uh, fuel, bar oil, um, just different stuff that we have a little bit of salvage here. Um, we have a light that we can utilize if it's a dark area um, and we need to light up the scene. We also have in this tool bag just any tools that we might need on a scene to correct an issue. Um, so like different wrenches, pliers, uh, electrical tape, duct tape, you name it, it's in this bag. Where our saws are contained. Um, so on a truck company, we carry a little bit uh, heavier duty saws. Um, some of the engines will carry these as well, but they're gonna be more on the outlying stations, meaning that a truck company would take a lot longer to get to that, um, that station or that scene. Um, so we have our K12 here. Uh, that's gonna be a larger saw with a wood tip blade on it um, and carbide tips. We have our chainsaw. This is gonna be what we probably do most of our cutting with. Uh, especially if we're doing like vertical ventilation, uh, maybe cutting a garage door, um, any type of wood. Um, but this is a carbide tip chain that we can utilize. Um, and it's, it's a pretty strong chain that uh, will withstand a lot of abuse. And then this here, this is gonna be a little bit smaller of a demo saw. Um, this one is gonna be our K12, um, but this is gonna be our K950. I'm sorry, 970. This blade here, this is gonna be a diamond tip blade. I know it's not all shiny like real diamonds, but um, the diamond tip helps us cut lots of different surfaces. So we can cut metal and we can cut concrete um, with this blade here. It'll also cut wood to a certain extent, but it's not very good at cutting wood. So we just have different saws in order to complete different jobs that we may need. In the top of this compartment, we have what we call a strong arm. Um, so this is just gonna be for popping doors. 
um, just anything that we need to apply force on uh, with our tips here so we can open it and close it. This will also do some cutting um, to an extent as well. On the top of the shelf, um, this is going to be just where all the batteries are um, that we're keeping charged on a regular basis. Um, we have different drills. Um, so if we're going to, if we need to fix a fence or something that we took down, um, if we need to cut stuff, um, we've got a cutoff tool here as well. Um, and then we also have a bottle jack that we can use for lifting. Um, so as you can see, like these trucks, they just carry a lot of tools. It's just a toolbox on wheels um, that we can come in and fix a lot of different problems that people have. On the truck company, when we're going to use our outriggers, we need to set our ground pads down. So we have these big ground pads. Typically what I'll do is just put my arm most of the way out. I'll set my ground pad down right where I was standing. When this outrigger comes out, it's going to set on the ground pad and distribute weight. Um, that way we don't sink into the ground or into the concrete. Um, these rigs weigh a lot. Um, this one I believe weighs just under 70,000 pounds. So 70,000 pounds on a small surface such as this one um, can, can cause issues for sure. So on this side of the rig, it's gonna be the same layout except we just have one more torpedo tube. Um, so these are all gonna be the same. This one's gonna have an extra extinguisher, um, our CO2 extinguisher. Um, and then we're going to have our water can in this one as well. And then the rest of it's going to be bottles. In this compartment, so our rig carries a rip pack. Um, all the trucks in South Metro's district cover rip pack, carry rip packs. Um, and then some of the outlying engines. So again, if we have engines that are running in the other districts constantly, um, or they're just outlying, they carry a rip pack just because we know how to use it and we're trained on our specific rip pack. So the rip bag is going to be for rapid intervention team, meaning that they are going to rapidly intervene for whatever issue that firefighter is having. Um, so this bag would typically be set at the front door um, for any incident that we have that involves an environment that's toxic uh, for us to breathe. So we have an extra mask in here. So if the firefighter um, were to have a mask failure or just a mask issue, um, I have a brand new fresh mask that I can put on my firefighter in order to keep them safe. Um, and breathe in clean air. I also have a buddy breather, um, so I can hook this into their pack. Uh, we have on our packs, we have buddy breathers, um, which is the same adapter as this. So I can hook into that, turn the bottle on, and then uh, they have a different supply of air. Um, and then we also have our universal connector right here, meaning that I can hot fill a bottle. Um, so when we go in, if their bottle was low, and we just want to be able to ditch the, uh, the rip pack in the structure and not have to carry it around. I can hook into the left side of their bottle. I can fill it up, it takes about 60 seconds with this bottle here, which is going to be the same bottle that's in our pack carrying 5,500 PSI. Um, so the pressure will equalize out. I can disconnect and I can leave this bag or I can take it with me um, depending on the situation. But that way um, they're not tied to the bag. They don't have to be stuck on the bag the whole time. So as I said, this is super important, um, especially if there's a firefighter that's trapped in a collapse, um, something fell on them, uh, or they fell in a hole, um, we can bring this bag and we can give them air so that we can get them out. Also in this compartment, we have what we call a search rope. Um, so I can take the search rope. Uh, typically we clip this to an object that's not gonna move, um, somewhere that's in a safe place, uh, maybe outside the structure, in a stairwell, somewhere where we know it's not gonna um, be in a bad environment um, and then we can play rope out so depending on the crew um, with our crew here this is something that the engineer would carry um, as he walks he's going to play rope out um, and kind of tend to the rope make sure it doesn't get tangled up um, anytime that we come across a corner a door um, some change of direction he's going to tie it off to an object in that area just so it's not moving back and forth um, creating a, or causing a problem and us getting lost. So as you can see here, we have a knot. Our knots are going to indicate um, how far we are into the structure. So for our large area um, policy, we're supposed to go into the structure um, and we're going to maintain one third air of work, one third air of work, um, um, sorry, one third air of egress and one third air of re reserve in our bottles. Um, so this helps us keep track of how far we are into the structure, what we've searched, where we've been, 
Um, and typically you'll see this on structures that are very large in nature, that are easy to get lost in, or a home that's really chopped up, um, someplace where it's just not easy to navigate. So this back here, this is gonna be our utility rope. Um, it's just gonna be small rope that we use um, for utility. So if we were to um, have to raise a tool, um, tie something off, secure something, um, that's what we'd use a small rope for. Nothing too fancy. This is gonna be where our firefighter tools are. Um, I say that and we have a lot of tools all over the rig, but typically known as the firefighter compartment. Um, so we've got a lot of the same stuff that we had on the other side, such as the bolt cutters. Um, these are just gonna be a little bit bigger for heavier duty locks. Uh, the Rex tool or the officer tool, uh, we use this for forcible entry um, to create less damage. Um, if we needed to pull a lock or a knob off of a door, um, we can use these forks in order to do that. Same concept on my uh, Halligan, but these are a little bit um, more specialized for that. Um, then we have the old man bar. Um, this is going to be just more for leverage. Um, so if we're trying to pull a storm drain off or um, pick, just pick something heavy up, uh, that's what we would use this pry bar for. And then obviously the irons, um, which is going to be what the firefighter carries for forcible entry or any time we're, anytime we're um, on a fire scene or a car accident, you name it. This is a swing door. So if we open this up, uh, we have what we call a W tool. Um, so on some of the other rigs, you may have seen a fan jack. Um, this is the same concept, except this is going to be hydraulic. Um, so it's just like the uh, bottle jack that you saw in the other compartment. Um, this is just going to extend and create pressure going side to side. Um, so it's adjustable. Um, I have a pin that I can pull and I can move this side back and forth. Um, I can also spin the tip here um, and create and fill distance. This handle here, I would just use a uh, crank and that's going to create my force side to side. Um, so we can hang fans on that. Um, that's not a typical practice that we have here at South Metro. Uh, we use more positive pressure fans, which you'll see in this other compartment. Um, but if we needed to get in somebody's home, again, less destructive, uh, we would use this to spread the door jams apart um, and the throw that's on the door, uh, we can just create space and then we can just push the door open um, and not create damage to the homeowner's house. This is gonna be what we call a hydro ram. So if we run into um, an apartment complex where there's um, a lot of residents that have been stuck in there um, or there's just a lot of doors that we need to search, a lot of apartments that um, we're not sure if there's anybody in, then we can use this hydro ram. So it's the same concept, hydraulic. Um, and if I were to pressurize it, I can stick this in the door, between the door and the jam, and I can pressurize it and pop the door open. Uh, just creates less work for me. Um, just like if there's 20 doors that I need to force, um, I can use this tool and it makes it a lot easier for me to force doors and I can do more work rather than the traditional way. On the other side of this compartment, this is gonna be our salvage covers and our floor runners. Um, so if we're fighting a structure fire and somebody has a lot of high dollar valuables in their house, um, couches, pictures, stuff that can't be replaced. Um, as long as we have the ability to, we're safe, the structure's been uh, searched. Maybe it's remote of the fire, but there might be water damage or smoke damage. Uh, we can come in and we can put these down in order to keep debris, water, smoke, all that stuff off of uh, our uh, victims' valuables in their house. That way they, they can't, stuff that can't be replaced or stuff that costs a lot of money. So this is gonna be what we call a Niederman. Um, there's a lot of questions that have been asked on what this is and why we hook it up to a rig, what it does. Um, so you can see this is our exhaust here. Um, every rig is going to have the same kind of setup. Um, so when we back into the bay or when we're leaving the bay, uh, we like to try to keep the exhaust gases out of it. Um, that way we're not breathing in nasty diesel, um, creating more cancer or causing any health issues for us. So anytime we're leaving the bay, um, this is going to be connected, or anytime we're coming into the bay backing in, uh, we're going to connect this. So it just goes onto the exhaust. There's just a magnet here. So it's just going to magnetize to it. And then if you follow it up, at the top of the ceiling there, there's going to be a big fan. And it just pulls all the exhaust out of the bay um, and then pushes it out to the top of the structure. Um, that way it's not contaminating our bay space. You'll see this also moves, uh, which you've probably seen in some videos. So as we drive forward, it just moves with us. And then eventually, when it gets taut, the magnet releases, and then we can drive off and 
That way the exhaust is still outside. This is going to be what we consider the officer's compartment. Um, so he's got his gear in here currently. Um, there's not really much that we contain in this compartment just because he's keeping his stuff in here. Uh, we do have a spare SEBA holder. Um, so if we ever have five on the truck, um, we can put another pack in here and then we can ride five in our truck. Typically we're staffed with four like we talked about earlier. That fifth person would then become Echo. Um, so we have Alpha, Bravo, uh, Delta, Charlie, Echo. In uh, the bottom of this compartment, this is gonna be our fan. Um, so this fan will move 12,839 cubic feet of air per minute. Um, so if you can imagine uh, 12,000, let's just say 13,000 for easy numbers, 13,000 basketballs moving through an environment um, because they're about a cubic foot of air, that's what this does. So anytime we're in a structure where we need to move air because it's toxic, there's smoke, um, let's say it's CO, hydrogen cyanide, anything that's dangerous to uh, basically life and humans or animals, uh, we can set this fan at the door and we can pressurize our building and push it out of an exhaust point. Uh, moving on, this is going to be um, just a compartment that has some water in it. So I've got a little cooler. It's just got water if we're on a scene that's extended. Um, typically during the summertime when there's a lot of construction, uh, we'll get called out for gas leaks. Um, so somebody hit a pipe with a backhoe or um, not drilling, whatever, um, and it's really hot and we have to wear our bunker gear and be ready to go. Um, so that's what we use that for or anytime we need water. This is going to be our um, fire alarm kit, if I can get it out of here. So in here, we just have different um, fire alarm stuff. So we actually have a fire alarm, carbon monoxide kit, um, battery, screwdrivers. Um, so if you're having an issue with your fire alarm, um, and it's just a repeated issue, there's, maybe there's no chance of you going to the store, uh, maybe it's an elderly patient that can't reach the fire alarm and it just needs to be changed, uh, we have the ability to do that um, and correct that problem. So you saw the elevator keys on the other side in the engineer's compartment. So I have those same keys. Um, each elevator is a little bit different. Um, so we have lots of different keys in order to open up the elevator doors um, and get patients out. Uh, we have door chocks so we can actually keep the door open. Uh, we have ways to lock the elevator system out. Um, that way the power can't be turned back on, especially if the elevator is having an issue and it can harm somebody. Um, and then like out of service tags so we can uh, make it easily identifiable that the elevator is not working. So this is going to be our inlet, uh, meaning that I can pull water from another rig um, or a hydrant. Um, it's going to be the same on the other side and I can connect to here and I can put water into my pump. Um, and then this is going to be our discharge. Um, so it's also five inch. Uh, right now we just have adapters on there. Um, so if we need to push water to another rig, uh, we don't necessarily want to use five inch because that's a lot of water that'll sit on the ground. Uh, we'd rather use a two and a half inch hose so that we get more water to the rig um, that's usable. Um, this is also going to be a discharge. Um, it's, this is a truly a two and a half inch discharge. Um, and that way we can connect two and a half inch hose and also um, discharge water to wherever we need. On the other side, uh, may not have seen it, but these are going to be drains. So anytime that it's cold weather ops um, or we just need to drain the pump, uh, the engineer will come by and he'll open up all these drains and it'll drain water out of the whole system. Not the tank, but just all the piping that is in the, in the pump system. Um, up here, this is going to be our hose as well. Um, as we said, we have the ability to pump water um, so we can pull a two and a half if we need to or an inch and three quarter. We have the ability to produce power off this rig. Um, we have a generator um, that actually sits right on the op uh, other side of this. Um, so we can run our generator and then we can use this just to plug in. Uh, these plugs are a little bit different than what you see at home. Uh, but on the other side of this, these are gonna be our traditional plugs. Um, so we can plug our quarter tools into them. Uh, we can run our fan, um, whatever we need power to, to power to, um, such as lights, we can run off of our cord reel. Behind these doors here, these are going to be just access into the pump. Um, so we have like a, a strainer here, a water strainer, so it just keeps debris out of the pump. That way it doesn't uh, clog it up or ruin it. Um, so the engineer, he, would, he, he can come in here and he can check it out, make sure that the strainer's clean. Um, if there's a pump issue, he can kind of look and diagnose what, what's happening. And it's going to be the same on this side. Um, you can kind of see like this here, this is a lever. Um, so on the other side, this cor correlates with 
uh, one of the levers that he would pull and, and put water to a hose line, a discharge, um, anything that we need water to. So we've got different uh, tools in here as well. So in that compartment there, you can kind of see that red bag. That's gonna be a roll up. Uh, we carry all of our medical gear in there because um, we have the ability to render aid to anybody that needs it um, at a basic level. And then we also have a Q-ray. Um, and so that's gonna read some different gases that we have in our atmosphere. So anytime that we have what we call smells and bells, uh, meaning that there's a fire alarm going off or there's some sort of odor that's in the air, uh, the firefighter would turn this on, it's going to calibrate, and then it's just constantly reading the air in the environment. Um, so you can see there's different uh, types of air on here. Um, CO2, oxygen, I'm sorry, CO, oxygen, LEL, meaning lower explosive limit. So if there's some sort of fuel in the environment that's uh, explosive, um, hydrogen sulfide, which is sewer gas, and then hydrogen cyanide. Uh, the trucks have a uh, five gas versus the engines have a four gas um, because we also have that additional um, hydrogen sulfide um, that the engines don't carry. So if they have a sewer gas smell, then they would have to call a truck and get this uh, Q-ray out there. Up on the top of the compartment here, um, in these bags, that's gonna be our ballistic gear. Um, so if we had a situation where there was an active shooter um, or somebody that was um, had the ability to create harm to us, but we needed to render care, we needed to be on the scene, uh, we could put our bulletproof vest, our ballistic vest on, um, and then we also have helmets in the, in the rig as well. Um, so the officer's gonna sit here, he's the crew manager, so he's gonna run the crew, uh, let us know what our tasks are gonna be, uh, what we're gonna do, um, just basically run the entire crew. Um, up here, this is gonna be his MDT, so every time that there's a call, stuff pops up on the MDT, um, he can click it, um, get all the information that the dispatch is getting, and then he can route us to the call on the mapping system. Um, some of the other things that the MDT has the ability to do um, through our GIS department, which is phenomenal, um, is look at um, the size of piping that's underground. So if we have a gas leak or a gas main that's broken, um, he can pull up an aerial view and it'll tell him how big that gas main is under the ground and where it's located. Um, same thing with water mains. So, where that becomes really important is mainly for water. So if we had a big defensive fire and we needed a lot of water, um, and let's say we're tapping our hydrant system dry, uh, we can look at our aerial view and we can find a different system. We can figure out where that next loop is, and then we can lay hoses and engines along that line to create more water and, and pull from a separate system. So we're not draining one of them. Bumper, this is what we call a trash line. Um, so it's just gonna be a shorter section of hose the hose that was on the side, those are 200 foot sections, um, but this is only gonna be a 100 foot section. So if we have a uh, small car fire, um, a trash fire, somewhere where we don't need to be parked further away, we can only pull 100, we can pull 100 feet, uh, which is just easier to manage, um, not as much hose on the ground, not as much wasted water. Now this rig is specific to South Metro as it's the only ladder truck that we have. So the other trucks have buckets on them, uh, meaning that they're a tower, a tower ladder, uh, but this doesn't have a bucket, so it just has that, that tip at the end. So really only one firefighter can operate at the tip most of the time. So this is what 105 feet of ladder looks like coming to the ground. And if you look here, you can see where the nozzle section is way back on that second fly. So this is gonna be in our rescue position. And then if I were to unpin it, it would come up and that uh, master stream would end up being right up here on this fly section. So that's what 105 feet of ladders look like right to the ground. And we can actually go uh, minus uh, eight degrees on this aerial and uh, get really low to the ground and bring our patient right to the right to the ground and have them walk off the ladder if we wanted to.